You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweetest girl I know. Hello, everyone. And welcome to History of the Great War, episode 74. This week, I would like to thank Peter and Tobias for becoming supporters of this podcast over on patreon.com slash history of the great war. They have now become members where they get access to special members only episodes. And they also unlock that nice, warm, fuzzy feeling that comes when you're awesome and you should feel awesome. After a long, hard-fought offensive at Verdun, the Germans were finally stopped by the end of July, and now it was time for the French to start pushing them back. It is these actions which we will discuss today. That is not all that we will be talking about, though, because they are not, quite frankly, that interesting. We will also finally get around to talking some more about what life was like in the trenches for the troops at Verdun. We will be specifically covering food and medical care at the front today. The last part of this episode will be a somewhat lengthy discussion on why Verdun became Verdun. And no, that does not mean I'll be giving a history of the town or the geographical area. What I mean by this is how what started as a limited offensive for the Germans became the focal point of effort for the entire attacking strength of the German army and the entire defensive strength of the French army. All of this and more will be covered in this, the penultimate episode of our Verdun story. We will start off this episode by covering something that I've probably not done a great job of discussing so far, and that is what was happening on the other fronts that was affecting the fighting at Verdun. This was a world war, after all. It will be a long time before we find out what the Brusilev offensive was in the East, something like three months before I plan on covering it. So I think I should give a quick summary of what was happening over there, since it had robbed the Germans of so much strength early in the summer. The Russians had received a message from the French back in March that asked them to launch an attack as soon as possible to try and pull German troops away from Verdun. The French pointed out that the attacks that they had launched in the fall of 1915 had partially helped the Russians out of the dire straits that they were in at the time. This pressure was put on the Russians and it spurred them into action, and they launched an attack on March the 18th near Lake Narok in modern-day Lithuania. The Russians seemed to have the advantage in this area. Their supply lines along the entire front had been greatly reduced in length after the retreat from Poland, and they drastically outnumbered the Germans across from them. But even with these advantages, the attack would still result in a spectacular failure. Five times the number of Russians attacked the Germans and overran the first two German trenches, but they could make it no further. For another week, the Russians tried to advance and accomplished only a lengthening of the casualty lists, and then it was over. This action caused so few casualties for the Germans that it had basically no effect on the fighting at Verdun. However, it did play a role in luring the Germans even further into the belief that they did not need to fear the Russians, especially their offensive capabilities. But they would soon learn that this judgment was false when, in June, General Brusilov would launch an attack on the southern end of the Russian front. Here, Brusilov would take advantage of the weak Austrian units and a new strategy that involved attacks along a massive front to prevent a counterattack. Over the course of just a few weeks, the Austrian army, after suffering hundreds of thousands of casualties, was once again very close to the breaking point. A constant stream of German reinforcements would have to be brought into the area. This did drastically affect the fighting at Verdun, as we discussed last week, when divisions were forced to be moved out of the reinforcement pool for Verdun to replace the troops that were sent eastward. 
This would cause the beginning of the end of the German attacks, as this movement of troops, coupled with the action soon to start on the Somme, would rob the 5th Army of the necessary troops to continue their push. So with that out of the way, let's skip back to our chronicle of events. Throughout the entire summer, Joffre had wanted Patan to be more aggressive. In the middle of June, he multiple times, I might add, insisted that Patan execute attacks to push the Germans back in a few key areas. These requests were resisted by Patan, and so Neville was brought in to replace him. Neville would just attack and attack, and given the state of the German troops at the time, it was bound to work in some areas. If you hit your head against the wall enough, eventually you will get through. You might just have to go through a few heads first. By the end of July, the Germans were set up perfectly for more attacks from the French, and throughout August, several French attacks hit them at various parts of the line. None of these were particularly large, but they went a long way to showcasing to everyone watching that the German situation was not good. Patan once again began to advocate for more troops be brought in, this time for attacking instead of just to rotate defending troops out. Patan argued that he could not launch a successful attack without these extra troops, and part of the problem was due to how depleted many of the French units were. Quote, the experience of several months proves that a unit that has lost a third of its combatants no longer offers sufficient resilience to resist an attack, or as a minimum, to maintain the integrity of the front. End quote. Even though August was one of the quieter months at Verdun, there were still casualties that required a constant movement of replacements into the theater. These would have to be added to the additional troops needed for the attack, for which preparations soon began. When Joffre sent an officer to Verdun on September the 13th, the goal was to discuss a possible future operation. He wanted Patan and his generals to give him an outline for a new attack that could then be refined, but Patan was one step ahead of him. He had a detailed plan that he was ready to put into motion immediately. Patan's plan was to attack with six divisions on a five-kilometer front. Patan asked for several new divisions to enact his vision, and after seeing Patan's plan, which Joffre called, and I quote, an offensive of great energy, end quote, he was provided with two new divisions and five other mostly rested ones to replace those in the line. Here is historian Alistair Horn, quote, The counteroffensive revealed the Verdun team of Patan, Neville, and Mangin working together in greater harmony than ever before. End quote. Mangin would execute the attacks and be responsible for carrying out the details. Part of this was a reorganization of the infantry platoons to shift the mix up of riflemen, grenadiers, and machine guns to better suit the needs of the battlefield. Neville was responsible for planning the details that Mangin would carry out. With his history in the artillery, he was particularly involved with the planning of that part of the operation. Part of this plan was to lay telephone wire below the bottom of the trenches to try and improve the coordination between the front lines and the gun lines. With this coordination, he planned to use a barrage that would stay just ahead of the infantry and also be able to adapt if the infantry needed it to be slower or faster. Patan, the man at the top, was responsible for overall planning and for all of the logistical and support functions that are so critical to large operations. Patan would get the troops from Joffre that he needed, and he was also able to bring in more artillery, both from areas of the front that he controlled and from all along the line. To go along with these functions, Patan also played another very important role. He was a restraining factor to hold the other generals back. He made sure that the goals of the opening attacks were attainable, and more importantly, the attack did not go off half-cocked like so many French counterattacks of the past several months. The goal for this attack was a big one. None other than Duamon itself. Of, of course it was Duamon. Everything is about Duamon. The preparations were in-depth, including a full-size outline of the fort laid out behind the line for French soldiers to practice on. Now, one of the interesting innovations that was developed for this attack was a method of getting water up to the front line and beyond. An engineer was brought in, one apparently involved in the creation of the Panama Canal, and he created a system of easily transportable canvas pipes that could be used to go out from the French lines and reach out with the advancing infantry. 
The system was, while slightly fragile, also easily mendable and also flexible, which were two aspects that were critical on World War I battlefields. The French would go into this attack with more confidence than at any other point in, at Verdun. On the other side, the Germans knew that they were in trouble. It was obvious that they had less men. It was obvious that the French had fresher men. It was obvious that the French now had the advantage in artillery. It was obvious that the French were just stronger all around. The offensive was originally scheduled for early October, but as was typical, it got pushed back until the 21st of the month. During all of this time, both preparations and during the delay, the French continued to concentrate more and more artillery on the front. By the 19th, when the bombardment really got going, they had over 700 guns. These included some of the largest guns in the French arsenal, with two 270mm, two 280mm, one 370mm, and two 400mm guns that were just as powerful as anything that the Germans had brought to Verdun throughout the campaign. For two days, these guns and many more focused mainly on shelling Douaumont in preparation for the attack. During those two days, the shelling did not cause too much damage to the fort. However, at other areas in the line, the German units were getting hit brutally. By the start of the attack, the German infantry's ability to offer any resistance was hanging by a thread. One interesting tactic that the French tried in the middle of the bombardment was to stop firing the guns and the troops were ordered to yell like they were getting ready to run forward in the attack, but they were not. The Germans, of course, did not know that the French meant to stay in their trenches and called down the German artillery on no man's land. Up until this point, the German artillery had been almost completely silent to prevent the French from finding their locations. This was a typical tactic in World War I, where the side with the less artillery on a specific battlefield would not fire until the absolute last moment when the infantry was moving across no man's land. But now, with the Germans' guns firing, they revealed their positions, and the French artillery rained down masses of counter-battery fire. As the bombardment began to reach its crescendo, Douaumont, which had been standing so strong for so long, was beginning to show some serious wear. The French 400mm shells were hitting it hard with a predictable interval of 15 minutes between shots, and suddenly there was a huge explosion within the fort, shaking it to its very foundations. Several of the French shells had been penetrating what was left of the concrete and earth carapace above the fort, and were starting to explode in the corridors. One of these shells got very close to the large caches of French shells that were deep within the fort and had been there since the beginning of the battle. It was clear that every time a shell landed, it was putting the entire fort at risk of exploding. There was also a fire raging through the corridors of the fort, which I'm sure wasn't helping anything. And so that night, the German commander ordered the fort to be abandoned, fearing that the fire would reach the arsenal. By morning, the Germans had successfully abandoned the fort, and also early the next morning, as the first wave of French attackers moved into the fort, they found it completely empty. What they found was that the fires had extinguished themselves during the night, instead of igniting the ammunition stores like the Germans feared. The French units then sent runners back to bring in more French soldiers, and once again, the fort was in French hands. And with that, the strongest fortification at Verdun was taken in an attack for the second time against almost no opposition. It's, it's really crazy that it managed to happen twice. And a French commander would say about the fate of the fort that, quote, a singular fate for a fort which during eight months had been the key to a field of battle watered with the blood of hundreds of thousands of men, end quote. When the French soldiers ran forward, they did it under the protection of a thick morning fog. They quickly captured Douaumont, like I said, and continued to push forward. Fleury and the Ourage de Thiamon fell in a front matter of hours something that had taken the Germans months to accomplish. The Germans that had been in the line had been worn down by the constant French fire, and some units had been without food or water for up to six days. Manja did not begin to learn how well the attack was going until well into the afternoon, since communication to the rear had for the most part broken down. Even when rumors began to make it to headquarters, everyone was far more cautious when broadcasting these, this news out and about. All of these great gains should have been instantly broadcast out to all of France. Earlier in the war, they would have been. 
but too many times the French press and military leadership had been burned when they publicly announced events only to have to retract them later. On the 24th, a few German units tried to counterattack, but there simply was not enough strength available to make it happen. By November the 2nd, Vaux had been retaken after having been also evacuated by the Germans. The German propaganda machines played down these setbacks, but for most of the people in the army, they knew what the losses of these key areas meant. The German threat at Verdun was definitively over. Hindenburg would be quoted as saying around this time that, quote, On this occasion, the enemy hoisted us on our own petard. We could only hope that in the coming year, he would not repeat the experiment on a grander scale and with equal success, end quote. During November and most of December, there was little action in Verdun, with both sides being completely exhausted. Neville did manage to push forward with an attack on December the 16th, which pushed the line beyond Douaumont and Vaux. This was approved by Patan, and it would advance up to three kilometers, with a minimum of a kilometer. What they found was only token resistance from a few German troops. And that, after the advance, was sort of the end. What had started with a bang in February had ended with French divisions rolling over German troops that were exhausted, outnumbered, and massively outgunned. Verdun was over. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com slash GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston in West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Two topics that have been in my notes this entire time for Verdun, and have been in the outline for every episode for about the last two months but have never made it in, are food and medicine in the trenches. I refuse at this point to not put them in an episode, so I'm putting them in right here because I can do that. Food was extremely important to the fighting, second only to water as the most important thing for the troops at the front. Now, beyond the obvious biological reasons why people need food, food also had a great effect on morale. All of the commanders recognized this fact, including Ludendorff, who would be quoted as saying, quote, The efforts of the army in the field depend on a high degree on their rations. That, next to leave, was the most decisive effect on the morale of the troops, end quote. Getting food to the front was always difficult during the war, especially during attacks. During quieter times, the rations were brought up nightly to the front lines. Generally, three or four men would be sent back to the rear for every company. These groups would go on a journey of up to 10 miles, which felt far longer, since on the way back they would be weighed down with food and water. During the rainy seasons, this was even more difficult due to the mud that slowed everything down. The guns of the enemy would, of course, not be silent during all of this. There were always artillery shells falling behind the lines, and if a specific resupply route was discovered, it would inevitably be targeted, 
Because of all of these factors, it was not unusual for the food and water to not even get up to the front. This meant that at times, little food or water was available for days. Generally, men would understand how difficult it was to get food to the front lines, even if they didn't like it. However, when they were off the front lines and in the rear, they became far less understanding to food interruptions. When food, and decent food, was made readily available to the troops behind the front, it was an instantly and noticeably positive effect on morale. This caused the French to undergo some serious reforms in 1916 to try and improve the food available to the men when they were off the line, especially to increase the availability of hot food. This type of reform would play an even larger role in 1917 when trying to solve the mutiny problems that the French army would have. This is not the last time that we will discuss food and drink in the line, behind the line, or on the home front. There will hopefully be an entire episode focusing strictly on this topic later this year, especially on some of the hardships on the home front, especially in Germany, that was being experienced during the war. During World War I, the medical facilities were never known to be great. But of course, like any other aspect of keeping the armies at the front, each country did things a little differently. For the French soldiers, this was very bad news, because they had the worst medical facilities and success rate of any of the three armies on the Western Front. For a soldier wounded at the front, the first link in the medical chain was the stretcher bearers. Every unit had a specified group of stretcher bearers at the beginning of the war, but most of these groups quickly ran out of members. Regimental musicians were also used for stretcher bearers until their numbers also began to fall short of requirements. And then you see other random groups like uh, the British Cavalry also was used as stretcher bearers quite often and other just random groups that weren't in the front line. But finally, a call for volunteers went out at the front to try and increase the number of stretcher bearers and their response was less than amazing. Being a stretcher bearer was a very difficult job, and it was a very dangerous job, especially when there was often a shortage of actual stretchers, and the men were forced to find other means of transit. I do not know if you've ever tried to carry a full-grown man who has absolutely no assistant and is just dead weight for any great distance, but the few times I have tried, I did not make it very far. Trying to bring in a wounded man without proper stretchers or suitable replacements was almost impossible on the battlefields of 1916 because they often needed at least two men to get a wounded off of the battlefield, but without stretchers, it was impossible to properly utilize the abilities of those two men at the same time. And of course, it did not make it any better on the wounded either. And oh, by the way, there was all those trenches and shell holes and enemy fire and mud and just horribleness. The problem with stretcher bearers, especially in the French army, was that it was sort of a cascading problem, whereby as there were less stretcher bearers, there was a lower chance of any particular soldier being picked up when wounded, which then resulted in less men feeling like it was worth it to risk their lives to be a stretcher bearer, which resulted in a lower chance of any particular soldier being picked up, and so on and so forth. This got to the point, especially on the more hotly contested battlefields like Verdun, where soldiers just assumed that if they were wounded, they would not be helped in any way, which did nothing to help morale. Even those that were brought off the battlefields and behind the lines were just at the beginning of their journey. If they survived their initial injury, and got picked up and brought behind the lines, and then survived the ambulance ride, and the ride in often unsanitary railway cattle cars, they then arrived at base hospitals that were completely overwhelmed pretty much constantly. At the beginning of the war, the French military had been planning on a short war, just like everyone else, and they'd also been planning on a war involving mostly bullet wounds. This meant that the number of surgeons was actually lower than they might have been otherwise if they'd been planning for artillery injuries. With the bullet wounds, there's often a cleaner wound with entry and exit points that sometimes do not even require a surgeon to work on. However, since there are so many artillery casualties on the battlefields of World War I, and for these injuries you almost always needed a surgeon, they were forced to make some choices. When men arrived at these hospitals, they were split into three groups, those that would die anyway and were not worth the time, those that would survive but would not be able to fight anymore, and those that could be saved to fight another day. In the cruel math of war, the third group got the lion's share of attention. This type of triage was used by other armies as well, but they always seemed to be a bit better at getting men stabilized and shipped out of the base hospitals, and usually back home for convalescence. <laughs> 
For the French, this was always a challenge. For example, from February the 23rd to the end of June 1916, 23,000 French soldiers died after they had arrived at the hospital. Keep in mind, that's after they arrived at the hospital. In fact, the French would have the highest ratio of deaths for the wounded on the Western Front, with 420,000 men dying during the war, after they had arrived at some form of aid station. The end result of all this was a definitive callousness among the French soldiers when it came to the wounded. One of the most important questions to ask, and one that is often discussed at great length and in excruciating detail, is why Verdun continued so long? Why did something that for both sides was accomplishing so little other than grind units into dust continue? I think the reason that this topic is discussed so much is because there is not a definitive answer. It took the decisions of so many people involved to create a situation where the fighting continued, and there was also a lot of luck and chance in there as well. On the French side, the reasoning seems a bit more obvious. The Germans were attacking a position in the French line. The French were defending it. However, while Verdun was a semi-famous location, it could have been abandoned early in the fighting without too much fuss. The French could have spun a story in the press about how fixed fortifications like those at Verdun were not important, they were saving their strength for other operations. However, when Castelnau arrived and gave the order to hold the East Bank at all costs, the French military decided that it was important. Joffre could have altered this order, but he did not. But if he was going to, it would have been shortly after this decision by Castelnau was made. Later wouldn't really have worked. Castelnau's decision did not put the military in a position where they were f- they physically could not retreat, but by deciding that Verdun was important, it made retreat a difficult option politically. The political dimension and the pressure from Poincaré and other members of the French leadership cannot be underestimated. They were strongly urging for the French to defend Verdun very strongly, and certainly to not abandon the East Bank, even if it was militarily prudent. Their concern reached beyond just Verdun, though. For more than a year, the French army had known nothing but failure. The French offensives start the war, the late year attacks to try and drive the Germans back, then all of the actions of 1915, all horrible failures. They hoped that Verdun would turn into a victory. Finally, a victory, please, somebody. While all of these men could have changed the French army's stance towards the fighting, the blame has to rest on the top and on Joffre. Throughout my research, I have always been a bit baffled as to why the French did not retreat, which would have allowed them to save more men for the attack on the Somme, which would have actually accomplished something, maybe. And in an attack instead of a defense, which Joffre, you know, hated. At the end of the day, the French decision could have been expected because they were in line with their tactical and strategic planning since the start of the war. Their goal since 1914 was to defend every step of French soil, no matter what the cost. And so that's just what they did. For the Germans, trying to understand why Verdun lasted so long is maybe more complicated. They were the ones attacking, after all, and throughout much of the battle they had the initiative and could have called it off at any time. In fact, Noble's door for placement as chief of staff of the 5th Army gave his evaluation after the war and said that the Germans should have completely withdrawn from Verdun at the end of April when it became clear that the attacks on the West Bank were not going as planned. This type of retreat at about this period of time was considered, but neither Falkenhayn or Noblesdorf thought it was a good idea. The problem for the Germans was that they put an artificial pressure on the army to capture Verdun, a completely fabricated pressure. Again, we've talked about it, Verdun didn't matter. For example, the Kaiser would say near the beginning of the fighting that, quote, The decision of the War of 1870 took place in Paris. This war will end at Verdun. End quote. The Germans fell into their own trap of placing too much prestige on one target, even when experiencing crippling losses. Even after Falkenhayn was replaced, this would continue, with Hindenburg and Ludendorff trying to hold on to what had been gained at Verdun, instead of pulling their troops back to better positions. To summarize everything, I think that there are two reasons that Verdun continued from February the 21st until near the end of 1916. First, prestige. For the Germans, the prestige they placed on capturing the town of Verdun, and for the French, the prestige of keeping it out of German hands. I would say that this reason was at a peak in late February, and then slowly tapered off in importance as the fighting continued. 
As it tapered off, and by tapering off I mean it became less of a factor in keeping the armies there, something else came up to take its place. I think it's this might be one of the greatest textbook definitions of the sunk cost fallacy. The sunk cost fallacy is often used in the business world, when a company continues on with a project not because it is cor- the correct move, and not because it's likely to be successful, but because so many resources have already been spent on it. Average on this can be applied to all of the fighting after about March, probably. After hundreds of thousands of men died for both the attackers and the defenders, it became extremely difficult to tell the army that the sacrifice was pointless and that they should just abandon those positions. Making that decision in, say, July or August means that all of those decisions of May, April, March, and February were wrong, and that all of those men that were now dead or wounded were wasted. The power of the sunk cost fallacy would peak in the last few months of the battle, when the Germans were barely holding on to horrible positions against French counterattacks, positions that were completely worthless, except for the fact that hundreds of thousands of Germans had died to take them. By the end of 1916, the nightmare of Verdun was over, but its effects on the armies and the German and French societies was just beginning, and we will talk about that next week.